Hi guys and welcome to Manch Talk. I'm Carla Garrick and I am very delighted to welcome my guest today, Mark Warden. Carla, great to be with you again. Thank you so much for joining me. As everyone who follows the show knows, Tammy is gone. I am going to get a word in edgewise. Imagine that. <laughs> <laughs> but also I'm like super excited to have Mark here because we we come a long way yeah, together. Yeah, we've been working together for about many years like as activists and volunteers. 16 years. Yeah. I was looking the other day because you moved in 2007, 2007 eight, yeah. seven, I moved in eight. Mm -hmm. Mark was the first person who helped me with pork fest. He was kind of like, hey, let me, you know, help you a little bit here. I'll look over marketing stuff. I'll, you know, oh, I think that was the first thing we worked on. And since then, we have worked on so many yeah. things. Many events and activities and campaigns. Yeah. So uh, before we get into the little bit I want to talk to Mark about, which will be, so for folks who are tuning in and want to know what's going to be happening this episode, we will be talking about real estate in New Hampshire because Mark Warden is an expert. Uh, he's been selling real estate both here and in Nevada. Before then, uh, we're going to talk a little about, about tokenization and um, how maybe anyone who doesn't live here or who does live here who wants to own a piece of New Hampshire, how you can get into the action. And then we're going to talk a little bit about how if you move to New Hampshire or if you're passionate about liberty, uh, if you already live here, how can you get involved and how can you make a difference? And the reason I wanted to talk to Mark about that is because he's actually someone who I admire, who has inspired me, who has really helped me like step up to the plate. So uh, I think he has some valuable things to add. So that's what's coming up in the show. First of all, I want to give a shout out to made in new hampshire expo so that was this past weekend if you follow the show you would have known that because we warned you last week i was very last minute i only got there on sunday afternoon and i was like oh man i really want to check this off i really want to go have you attended i have been in the years past yeah that's great good yeah. selection of vendors and people who are doing things around new hampshire so made in h I actually think like I, it, it occurred to me when I was there is maybe next year we try and do some kind of uh, event around it as kind of one of our anchor events. Because mm -hmm. I do think uh, people who maybe don't live in New Hampshire but who are curious about this incredible vibe we're creating here, um, it really is kind of cool to see what people are making what they're up to you know hot sauce uh face masks i got this lovely face mask for it's a matcha night mask so we will weigh in and see if i'm you know <laughs> 10 years younger next week um this from uh from new hampshire i had no idea this was being made it's being made on the west side of manchester like in our hood it is uh chocolate that is comes from all over the world vetted small uh, Louie and I did a taste test last night, and we loved all of it. And this one has lion's mane mushroom. So this is it. lion's mane mushroom. This is oh. not therapeutically happy <laughs> mushrooms, uh, although there was nothing wrong with that either. Uh, all things in moderation. But this one actually is lion's mane, and lion's mane they've now determined actually is really good for memory. Oh. So as as you know, Mark and I are never going to age, but <laughs> should we? <laughs> yeah, I need some of that. I better. Go, if I hope I remember to go buy some of that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, between the two of us, or someone who's watching this, send us a message at mentalk at gmail .com and remind us that we want to buy some lion's mane chocolate. I also got some like really cool little postcards. Uh, doing funky little things. Uh, I thought this one was really cute too. It's got a little cat on it. This one made me laugh because it says, stand up to the man. Stand up to the man. So of course that's going to appeal to me uh, with a little new new hamster. <laughs> It shows the man in the mountain. People can't see it on Yeah, on so it, it has the man on the mountain, but of course it is also standing up to the man. So uh, that was this weekend. You guys should all put it on your calendar for next April. Uh, it is a yearly event. They also have one in November that is very Christmas focused. So uh, be sure to check that out. But now shifting gears to the main event, not the Lions main event, the actual main event. Uh, Mark, so you're technically sort of kind of my boss now <laughs> on some <laughs> tangential, not way, way. But basically, I did take the real estate exam last year, 
And actually, it came up in my memories. I've been a real estate agent now for one year. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you're, you know, you've been doing this a long time in New Hampshire. W like, what are you seeing in the market? Like, where are we? Yeah, I started at an interesting time moving here in 2007. And after taking a year off, I got really into this full time in the real estate business around 2008, 2009. And back then, it was right. It was, the real estate prices were dropping still a little bit. They hit bottom in 2010, 2011. So that's really when we started getting super busy with a lot of foreclosures and people buying uh, a lot of these distressed properties, but also at a really good price. And we have a lot of multifamily properties here in Manchester in particular, but all the mill cities like Nashua, Concord, up and down the river. And there were some really amazing returns on investment. Uh, people were getting great cap, what's called a cap rate or capitalization rate returns on those buildings, even though rents were a lot lower at that time, but the price of the property was was so good, so attractive, interest rates were much lower too. So then we had this boom of uh, about 10 years where things were really good for real estate investors and very quite affordable, say for the first eight or nine years of quite affordable for most buyers based on the their incomes and also the interest rates. But bam, 2020 hit, 2019 into 2020, but 2020 with COVID lockdowns and there was this, all these people came in from out of state, now they could work from home, work remotely. So we saw this huge run up in demand. And we're still facing that to some extent. So, you know, fast forward to 2020 through 2024, still we have an inventory shortage. There's a lack of good housing out there, not much new construction going on. So buyers are really feeling the pinch. Okay, well, um, let's unpack some of that. So first of all, what is the current interest rate? Like, what are we looking at? It's in the sixes, mid sixes, okay. for a 30 year fixed mortgage, conventional mortgage. And then of course, anyone who is watching this, uh, if you can help it, do not get an adjustable adjustable rate, <laughs> right? I, I saw a post this morning on X from someone who said, oh, I got this really good deal. My original rate was 2.3. I wasn't paying attention. Yeah. It was a, you know, adjustable ARD. And, uh, and now my, my thing's gone up. You know, I mean, I want to say it was, I mean, it like doubled, right? Yeah, in the, in the early aughts, those adjustable rate mortgages were quite popular. And it was a way for somebody to get into a property um, initially with very low payments. And it was, it was good for maybe somebody who was accelerating in his or her career where they knew their income would be rising along with these interest rates. Right. But you can get in a real pickle if you know if you have trouble with your job, you lose job, or your income doesn't go up to keep up with it, it can be a real problem. So generally we, we tell people to, if you can't, uh, can't qualify in the 30 year mortgage, you know, maybe you want, maybe it's not the right time or look for a lower priced home. Right. And then of course you mentioned also the housing shortage and you know, as people, both of us who, who have a, deep appreciation for free markets and sort of letting people make their own decisions in life. I think that's important for people to understand. When you're a proponent of free markets, really what you're saying is you're saying, why don't you let the decision makers make the decisions and get the middlemen out of the middle, right? Uh, you know, except us, we're important middlemen and women. But um, wait, the, the interest rates are obviously impacting things, but more so, as you mentioned, the housing shortage. So you used to be a state rep. Mm -hmm. um, what have you seen? Like, I'm sure you probably like over the years, we've talked as people who believe in markets about reducing zoning, trying to, you know, liberalize the market in the literal sense of the word to allow people to build housing and that kind of stuff. Have you, Mark, been warning people <laughs> about what we were seeing right now? <laughs> it has been obvious for many years that there was not much new construction going on. Yes, there are some spots here and there, and a few bright spots around the state include Salem, let's say Londonderry, where they're very pro-building, pro-building permit. And they've been pushing a lot of construction, and they've been successful. But that's a minority of towns and cities around New Hampshire. Uh, and there were a number of factors involved. One is just the the high cost of building new homes. Uh, now, labor, is that New Hampshire specific or is that just It's in more general? so here. It's a little bit more here okay. than down in the Southwest. Yep. We have a lot more immigrant labor down there and it's a lot easier and uh, less expensive for labor down there in the South and the Southwest. So that's one problem we're facing here. Uh, but also the zoning is fairly prohibitive in most of the towns and cities where they limit the number of homes you can build uh, in a certain 
on, in a certain zone or how many you can put on the lot, usually limited to only a single family home in, in most zones. And they have uh, some onerous regulations regarding setbacks, road frontage, acreage for septic systems and that sort of thing. And they, they vary from town to town. So it's another wrinkle for builders. Uh, they may be totally different between Goxtown and Bedford and uh, New Boston, even though the towns are adjacent. They have to you know, a whole different permitting process for each one. And, and, and then of that course, becomes expensive, right? Well, then it's expensive, yeah. And now the cost of capital is even harder for, for the builders to face it. And frankly, it was just so much easier to buy existing real estate for a decade that builders stayed out of it. They mm. lost a lot of money in 04, 05, 06. They stayed out, and then people would just uh, buy an old house and fix it up for much less money than could building brand new. Yeah, the, the, the home channel has certainly uh, <laughs> inspired a lot of people to flip I like homes. watching through <laughs> myself, yes. <laughs> um, all right, so, so the market is shifting. And you know, it's funny because I don't think people fully understand with, with ADUs, right? So, so the sort of extra dwellings, right? Like you, and, uh, you could put a tiny home on your back lot. Um, we were talking about this on the show last week, Tammy and I, and I mentioned to her when, when Lou and I got married in South Africa. So he was an engineer, you know, working at the top science institution, and I was a first year lawyer. And we lived in a nice little, you know, unit in someone else's backyard because we wanted to live in a nice neighborhood, but we couldn't mm -hmm. afford a house in that neighborhood. We could, as a young engineer and a young lawyer, afford someone's, you know, a dwelling in the back of the house, right? And that was just the way things were. Like, you had to work your way up in life, right? Well, this is an example of one of the reasons regulation has caused a lot of problems with the housing industry. And you referenced ADU, which stands for Accessory Dwelling Unit, um, a term they've used in the legislature here. Uh, other people call them like an in-law suite, mother-in-law suite, or granny flat, right. that sort of thing. But we had to go through the legislative process years ago with the help of the realtors, lobbyists, and such to force towns to not prohibit them. That is, force towns to allow these ADUs to be built because a lot of towns were restricting them. And you know that's an invasion of property rights, of course, and it's another reason that we have big problems with the, the housing shortage because it's, it's difficult to build these things. But it opened up uh, to some extent. Towns can still regulate the size of them, whether they have to be attached or detached, things like that. But you know it was a little a little bit of uh, improvement for the free market. So. Oh, I mentioned this idea to Jason Sorens, who, of course, is someone we both know as well. Uh, he's the founder of the Free State Project, wrote the essay back in the day, kind of, you know, came up with this concept of, oh, if you put a bunch of free marketeers together, maybe you could build, I don't know, Switzerland 2.0, maybe Hong Kong before the commies took over, something mm -hmm. like that. And right? Jason's also an expert on housing. And authored the New Hampshire Housing Atlas. Exactly. So that was what I wanted to mention is there's this incredible tool that is out there for anyone to use, including the, the enemies of, of liberty. But, you know, we're equal opportunity. More information allows all of us to make better decisions. Um, and so they did that unveiling at St. Anselm mm -hmm. with this tool that you can go into. I'm going to blank on the URL right now, but I'll drop it in the show notes later. Um, you know, you can literally put in a street address and then look up what is the zoning, how, like, what are you allowed to do, what is your tax rate. Um, I was really surprised to learn there were 21, I believe was the number, um, uh, zoning free areas in New Hampshire that don't actually, you know, people talk about Grafton, mm -hmm. but they're more than that. I had asked Jason, like, like, could we just... Could we just have a moratorium on zoning for 10 years? Would, would you support something like that? How would we go about pitching that and what would be good about it? It'd, it'd be nearly impossible, politically speaking. Uh, the, the <laughs> because NIMBY, all good uh, ideas go to die. <laughs> the, nim, the NIMBY factor is very strong. All right, explain it, for folks in, what is NIMBY. New Hampshire, that's another ac an acronym. Uh, it stands for Not In My Backyard. backyard. And that's where the, a lot of people in New Hampshire just like the way their town feels. They maybe it feels a little quaint. Uh, they feel like they don't have a lot of uh, traffic and they don't want a bunch of new construction, these so-called McMansions being built there. They claim that they fear that it'll, just all, it'll bring in a lot of uh, young families with kids and then it'll overpopulate schools and that's a big expense. Now that's a, that's a false premise. It's a false argument because the fact is that 
there's excess capacity in almost all the schools. Right. Enrollments have been dropping for decades in decades. New Hampshire. Decades. Yeah, of course, increases in spending still happen, but there's plenty of capacity in, in schools around the state. Uh, but most people just like the way things are and they're afraid of change. And people also claim to like the so-called local control. Mm. And that's a big issue with zoning. Towns want their own little fiefdoms. People who are there enjoy uh, the town vibe and they don't want right. it to change. Even if it could be for the better, a lot of people are afraid of change. Well, and it was an interesting thing I heard at Liberty Forum, which of course we just got done with a couple of weeks ago where we brought hundreds of people to the great Granite State to come see what life is about here and the great quality of living and you know, come invest in New Hampshire with us. And uh, someone on the housing panel said something that really struck me. They, they mentioned that even a town like Amherst, which has very strict zoning, uh, Glamhurst, as we might mm -hmm. call it. Um, you know, y y people love their town square, but if you actually look at it, it is multi-use. The one thing we cannot get anyone to accept now, right? Like there's a gas station, there's a bakery, there's a whatever, like all these areas. And so I think maybe we just need to help people understand that allowing people to make their own decisions will probably trend towards a, a better solution because the things we like about old towny stuff is because they had the freedom with their property to do what they want. Yeah, along those lines, you look at the historic districts in a lot of these towns, including Amherst, but look at Portsmouth. People love walking through downtown Portsmouth. Of course, you could never build that stuff today because the buildings are right, go on right road. on the sidewalk, yeah. And of course, the setback requirements today would never allow that, but you know, it's charming and it's quaint. Yeah, and so we want more charming and more quaint, but we also want to bring crypto into this conversation. Uh -huh. So for folks back home who do not know, uh, there is this technology called the blockchain technology, and it's basically the like layman's way to think about it is it's a ledger that allows you to have a contract over here that gets vetted or audited over here. So someone promises something and we can watch if they delivered. Uh, there are smarter people who can explain it better, but that is like Carla's uh, not, not, not technical understanding. So what is currently happening is there is a shift to see here, at least for us, if there's an appetite to have people uh, invest smaller chunks of money. Not all of us are millionaires or billionaires, uh, but I will take every crypto millionaire's money. Don't get me wrong. Um, so we're trying to figure out if we can combine this new technology and crypto with DAOs, which we'll explain in a second, in order to make it so that more people can invest in New Hampshire. So let's start with what is a DAO? So it is a distributed autonomous organization. I think that's correct. Is it distributed or decentralized? So I, last time I did a workshop, I said decentralized because that's how I look it up. Uh -huh. But my husband, who never watches anything, but happened to catch that second of me <laughs> saying it wrong, was sure to point out to me that it is actually distributed. Okay, I'll take his word for it. <laughs> but whether it's distributed or decentralized, <laughs> I think it captures the same idea. And the idea is pretty much that we're uh, the, the technology basically allows you to do things faster because it is already codified, for lack of a better way to explain it. So with tokenization, the way you can think about it is almost like shares, right? So this DAO, the DAO, is almost like a corporation. It, that's right, it's an entity. And it has limited liability and um, you will be able to buy a portion, think of it as a share, and none of this is financial advice. Everyone go get your own stuff, all the disclaimers. No one should ever listen to anything I have to say and act on it without also checking with another expert. Uh, but everyone should be fasting. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so, I mean, there's real risk here, but we are actually on the cusp of this entirely new thing, and it's kind of new for real estate in general and dynamic and really new and cutting edge for us here in New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. So we did a talk at Liberty Forum. I thought that was pretty well received. It definitely was. Uh, typically our crowds, you know, they like 
they're critical thinkers, so they like to poke holes in things. So it was really dynamic. Like we almost didn't even get through the talk before folks were like, hey, what about this? What about this? Right? Because it's new. And then we did the follow up webinar, which had a ton oh, yeah. of people. So it seems like there's real interest in this. Like, how you t tell folks, first of all, like, what, what was your journey with crypto? Because you're actually like a, uh, uh, the Afrikaans word is bon breaker. I'm not going to remember the word now. Mm -hmm. Like you're a you're a, 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 a path trailblazer. Trailblazer. There you trailblazer. go. Trailblazer. Yeah. I got to it. <laughs> well, I've been uh, around libertarian circles for a long time, even before moving to New Hampshire. And a lot of the liberty folks were early adopters of cryptocurrency. Started out with uh, Bitcoin. Bitcoin. And we've discovered it, talking to other people back in 2009, 2010, and then at the Pork Fest or Porcupine Freedom Festival that, that you ran for a couple of years, there were a lot of people starting to spread the word. They were these evangel evangelists for blockchain technology, Bitcoin, cryptocurrency. I mean, and, and I these the were ideas. people like Roger Ver, who just wrote a book uh, on the Bitcoin battles and yeah. like there's been a hijacking of Bitcoin and the maxis and all of that for the people who are really into this stuff. Roger Ver came to Porkfest, uh -huh. um, uh, uh, the, Eric Voorhees. Eric Voorhees and the guy who invented Ethereum. Yeah, Vitalik. yeah, Vitalik, Vitalik he was he here. I mean, you know, I was like, I mean, I don't even know that much about crypto, and I'm pretty sure I was on the cover of Coinbase magazine or something. <laughs> I don't even know, well, man. My, but we were that well, early. Well, yeah, sorry. I remember buying a, at Porkfest a pint of honey from a local apiary for one Bitcoin. Oh, wow. Today, for those of you who don't pay attention, today one Bitcoin is worth about $70,000. But this is uh, many years ago. That's sweet, so we were, sweet honey. Uh, <laughs> the best honey ever had. And But I, I've always been interested in it just to support the idea of it being, first of all, decentralized, uh, uh, anonymous, at least pseudonymous. And it's, a, it's, uh, it's an alternative to the fiat system that we have, the Federal Reserve, and the government controlling all the money. So I love that it's peer to peer. So I always was following it and supporting it for that. Even though I didn't really understand the technology and the math, I love the idea and the concept. And then in 2017, Bitcoin had gotten a little bit more traction. It was up to about $10,000, $11,000 that time. It actually sold a house for Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah, I was the first real estate broker Hampshire, here, right? here in New Hampshire yeah, yeah, to do so. So that was a milestone and did that again in 2019, really to prove the concept. Right. And it's, it's smooth. It works great. You just need uh, the parties to understand it and have both ends of the transaction who are involved in that. And, and, you know, just because we harp on this so much on the show, why we think, you know, uh, private deals and, and less government intervention is, is the way to go. With something like this Bitcoin, you allow people to, um, to contract with each other, right? And the old uh, Roman Dutch or the common law thinking is, you know, buyer beware, right? So, like, make sure you're putting together a deal with a willing buyer and a willing seller. And, you know, all this protectionism does is it actually allows bad actors to get away with more stuff mm -hmm. instead of forcing people to vet who, who they're dealing with and what they are doing. We're up to five minutes left, so let's make sure we do cover everything else we want to cover. So with the tokenization, um, I think next steps for us in terms of what we're, we're sort of doing uh, through Porcupine Real Estate, of course, partnering or working with uh, Ledgeview Commercial as well, is we had done that webinar and people can go to YouTube. You can find it on my YouTube channel, CarlaGarrick.com or at Porcupine Real Estate. Um, on YouTube, there are a lot of there's a lot of content there. Like there's mm -hmm. a lot of really good information on the PRE YouTube channel. But specifically, this tokenization uh, webinar, we had some technical difficulties, so it was like not my <laughs> finest just to moment. Uh, explain tokenization means issuing tokens as a percentage of ownership. So it's similar to fractional ownership in a real world asset such as real estate. Could be an income producing building, an apartment building, an office building, something else. It's somewhat akin to uh, REITs, which are real estate investment trusts, but those are traded on uh, the exchanges uh, with shares, and they have a much different structure than we with tokens. But basically, you have this real world asset, could be artwork, could be gold, could be a building, and then the ownership is divvied up or divided up into a number of tokens. Maybe you issue 100,000 tokens, then those tokens can be bought and sold among from peer to peer. Right. And, and that's on a secondary, secondary market. 
That's secondary right. market. And that, of course, is important because the SEC has already decided, the court cases have decided, secondary markets are not securities as defined under the SEC, although the SEC candidly doesn't really know what it's doing. Right. It keeps telling people, do this, they do it. Then they're like, no, that's wrong. No, do this, no, do this. And then they just end up destroying literally more than one person who I personally knows lives uh, because of their ineptitude and incompetence. Because again, they think they are, sorry, I'm tirading, but they, they think they're all knowing and they're like, we must document everything instead of just letting things evolve. And then we learn best practices and then the market kind of ekes towards what would work best. But anyway, I digress. So with the tokenization, uh, for folks who are looking to get involved, please do go to the website, uh, Porcupine Real Estate. You can sign up there for the mailing list. It'll come right up, and then we will let you know when there is more stuff to learn about this. Um, we were going to talk about your fullest practical efforts. So in our last couple of minutes, uh, let free staters or people who are pro-liberty for low taxes in New Hampshire, really just want to live and let live, uh, how can they get involved? What, what's coming up for the rest well, of the you year? You know, I've discussed this before, Claudia, there are really many paths to liberty. Uh, I got involved in the political process by being elected four times to the New Hampshire State Legislature, and I thought that was an effective way to use my personality and my skills and my interests to advance liberty. But other people may find it just being a, a farmer, for example, raising your own food or selling it to your neighbors is a very impactful way to get out of a sort of big corporate food system. Uh, raising children, homeschooling is a fantastic way to advance liberty in our lifetime. And I, another one, I think it's important to build our economic system by uh, being, building a business. So those are the things that, that I think are the most effective to advance freedom. And people need to figure out what works for them and what they're, they're best suited for. I love that. And in the last minute, I'm going to put out a pitch also that I think that if you uh, have lived in the state of New Hampshire for more than two years and you are pro-liberty, you better be running for something this November. I don't care if you put your name up to be the library trustee in the most left-wing progressive town in the great state of New Hampshire. You got to do something because we call that the fullest practical effort. Someone like Mark Warden is a living, breathing example of what that is. You got to do at least half as well as Mark has, <laughs> and then we will start to say we are going to get liberty in our lifetime. There's a bunch of stuff coming up this week. You can go to my YouTube channel to learn more. Uh, tonight, there is a debate up at Dartmouth between Spike Cohen, who will be at Porkfest this year, um, Spike Cohen against David Hogg on uh, gun rights up at oh, Dartmouth tonight. One. It is already sold out. How do I know? I couldn't get a ticket. I'm kind of hurt. But there is also tomorrow night there will be a meetup at AFP's office with Spike Cohen. So if you can't make tonight's debate, be sure to come to that. That is in Manchester. You can get more information at AFP and H. That is all we have for this week's Manch Talk. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Mark, for joining me. And we will see you guys back here next week for another scintillating edition of Manch Talk. Thanks, guys. <laughs>